today, my special guest is George Takei. He's an actor, an activist, a social media maven. Welcome, George. Good to be here. All right. So let's get right to it. You have become so much more than Sulu from Star Trek, and that's just amazing to see that trajectory. But I got to go back there and anchor in some techie things because Star Trek was one of the first encounters anyone had with an imagined future where gadgets and computers and machines were in the service of all of our greatest needs. So at the time, were you self, have that self-awareness on the show? All of us, I think, knew that uh, Gene Roddenberry, the creator and the visionary for Star Trek, had that kind of vision. We told wonderful stories that also had substance, some commentary on our society today. I can't expect Gene Roddenberry to be at the frontier of all tech developments. How did you accomplish that in the show? Because he, he's a Hollywood guy. He's a Hollywood guy, but he is a science fiction buff who wanted to bring that uh, passion uh, into his projects. And so uh, we had uh, the RAND Corporation. The RAND Corporation? Yes. Ooh. Which assisted us on the uh, speculative technology of the time back in the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. And so we did have, you know, that amazing device on our hip that we flipped open and we talked on it. Wherever we were. And there was no wires connected to it or anything. That was the amazing thing about it, because we were so dependent on the phone booth mm -hmm. or our, our fo home phone. You know, that, hey, you got any dimes to put in the box? <laughs> right, right, right. So that, that took some innovation, clearly. But now, today, we've far surpassed <laughs> that device that we call the communicator <laughs> in all the things that we do in the palm of our hand. You guys perhaps under-imagined what it could be. Exactly that. One innovation stimulates more innovation and the ripple effects go out. And sometimes that the pathways to those secondary tertiary innovations are not visible to you right in the front line. Exactly. There. You have to get through these, these prosciniums and say, wow, now I can do that and now I can do the other. It all, you know, ripples out. Isn't there a Google X Prize for something that resembles the tricorder? There's some prize I think they're money. working on that, There's yeah. Pr some meaningful prize money for the first person who basically has a portable device yes. that can scan Take the body. Your, um, basic things like uh, your uh, temperature, but uh, you know, the how clogged your arteries are. Right. Or, without, uh, without cutting you open. Exactly that. Right. The innovations that uh, are prompted by one innovation is incalculable. One of my favorite ways that storytellers communicate this kind of contrast between what is and what can be, is when you have a time travel episode and you mix the future with the past. And of course, in the movie Star, in Star Trek IV, uh, was that The Voyage Home? Yes, yeah, The yeah. Voyage Home. The Voyage Home. So now we have all you future people coming into the then present, which I guess was the mid-1980s. That's and right. Of course, you have to have a scene in the hospital where Bones is watching what doctors are doing and can't Stand it! <laughs> like, this is like the dark ages, cutting open skulls and this sort of thing. The frustration of not being able to, you know, share the, uh, what we have in the future. But, you know, there's, there's that other scene where Scotty, the engineer, he's studied history. And uh, they say, oh, that's a computer. Oh, I know about computers. <laughs> and he picks up the mouse and says, computer! <laughs> <laughs> It's always good for some insightful commentary and some laughs when you cross time what, what device one person and has. And that humor another. is what connects everybody. You don't have to be a technician, a scientist, and at the same time, you know, you're inspired. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, yes, that can be done. And we also, as you know, in Star Trek, we dealt with social justice issues. Practically every show has some... Let me ask you... Could, Not practically, every show. Just every show. The makeup of the crew made a statement. Diversity. That alone, if nothing the, else happened. The that point was, was that it was the diversity of this planet that was the strength of this planet. By getting the best of that, that diversity and working in concert as a team, you can boldly go where you hadn't been before. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think anyone was thinking that way at the time. Oh, it we was a, revolutionary. We need a crew, just get the five white people, because those are the actors in the line That's here. Right. Not even Nobody's thinking about the demographics of Earth. And if you're going to represent Earth, you really should look like Earth. And that diversity is visible, mm -hmm. but it's also audible. People who come from different cultures have different sounds to the, to the way they speak. Right. And they have different faiths. 
And so, you know, we suggested all of that diversity. Uh, one the diversity they were reluctant to deal with was the diversity of uh, sexual orientation. I, we, I discussed that with Gene Roddenberry. Did you? Oh yes. my gosh. As a matter of fact, yes. Whoa. I was still closeted, but okay. uh, as- You were closeted until like, a couple, <laughs> like yesterday or something. <laughs> no, no, you came out very late, right? In, very in your, late in, in your my life, my 60s. Uh -huh. And the reason for that was I wanted my acting career. Mm -hmm. So I had to be silent on that issue. We had one episode in which Captain Kirk, a white man, kissed Uhura, our chief communications officer, an African woman, and all the stations in the American South refused to air that. And our ratings, which was, uh, were low to begin with, plummeted to rock bottom. Mm. And when I talked to Gene Roddenberry about the issue of uh, uh, equality for LGBT people, uh, he said he wants to do that, he uh, knows that that's part of the diversity of this global society, but he's first of all got to be on the air in order to make that statement. Right. You can be right, but it's no good if you're not also effective. You have to be effectively right. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think even the level of social justice storytelling that existed, do you think you couldn't have gotten away with that? if it took place on Earth rather than space? Because you could just say, oh, it's just science fiction. So what's that show with one half were black? It's one alien group was black on the right side and white on the left side. And another alien group was black on the left side and white on the right side, and they couldn't get along. They couldn't get along. <laughs> so you can't just show different people on Earth having that fight and have the potency of that story compared with telling it in space with aliens. So I'm just wondering if this was part of the master plan to put a mirror of social justice right up into the American face in a way that people didn't think of it as a mirror. You're just telling a story out there on planet Zebulon. <laughs> certain segment of the audience was able to see that. And that's the audience we had. You know, mm -hmm. we were big on college campuses. And they uh, were, first of all, stimulated by the amazing technology of the show. The one technology that we haven't achieved yet that I earnestly pray for is the transporter, mm. where we just sparkled for a few seconds and popped out, and then sparkled at our destination and popped in. Together with that kind of technology, uh, if we had projected that vision of the future coming together on current society, uh, it would have been science fiction again. So you want the transporter? Yes, I so, want so the transporter. Here's, if we had the transporter, here's how I think it would be used. I don't think we'd be transporting ourselves back and forth. We'd be transporting goods. So your refrigerator, you finish your milk, it just sparkles in another quart of milk. And the trucks that are plugging our interstates, you just beam those to where they need to be. Because maybe your travel is part of your experience for your vacation. Well, I don't know. I could, if I go to Australia, I don't think I want to spend all that dead time. I still maintain that we can find some way to transport people. Well, Elon Musk is uh, working on that. Yeah, we got top diabolical people. We got, yeah. We got. Put us in maybe uh, one of these capsules. People and who have you know, the intelligence and the money. To, these are like Tony it's Stark. very expensive, yes. It's Tony Stark, exactly. the Iron Man. He is the cinematic counterpart to Elon Musk. Right? <laughs> and you got to live long enough for that. I sat next to a, a doctor on a plane trip from L.A. to uh, New York, and he maintained that this body is mechanically programmed to be operational for about 140 years. Mm -hmm. Max. It's yeah. because of what we do to it, or not do for it with all the knowledge that we have now that it wears down and the machine breaks down. But then I've been reading of others where they're projecting 200 years. I'm betting that the 140 year estimate was just the limit to what our body is given normal circumstances. Mechan yeah. Whereas the 200, that's after we've intervened in some that's kind of right. fundamental way. Right. And if you can go to 200, why not 300 or 400? And, I mean, you know, a two or 300 year old us may not all be who we are now. Right, you know? right, right. As right. long as this part here is constant. Until the day where we can cure Alzheimer's, and until the day we can cure ALS, one is a body that wastes away under a perfectly intact mind, and one is a perfectly intact 
body that has a mind waste away within it. So maybe we can have a brain body transplant. So the brain of an ALS patient into the body of an Alzheimer's patient. Well, cryogenics. Actually, I'd rather is both be cured, right? But if you can't <laughs> cure them, do the brain transplant. Well, yeah. while we're still operational, mm -hmm. both mentally and physically, uh, there's that idea of freezing us, cryogenics. So a few more gadgets. Coming out of the Star Trek series, there's a bunch of things. There was a machine that made food hot instantly, that <laughs> I think even created the food as right. well. Also, the fact that there'd be a computer screen rather than a printout. I remember I was into computers very early. We didn't have screens. Screens were not a meaningful part mm. of your computer experience until well into the 70s. It was all about paper. You guys had no paper in the series. That's right. That was very forward thinking. That, we had uh, what we call our console. And we had intergalactic communication We're back with headquarters. And we mm -hmm. talked to each other visually and all Did they ever explain how that was actually managed? Because you, you know, still have to go the speed of light and then it still takes I didn't while. talk with the uh, Rand Corporation <laughs> <laughs> consultants. Well, maybe they, had, they knew something that you, could, you weren't supposed to know. <laughs> I maintain if something is conceived by this human brain, we can find a way that the innovators, that the technical people, the inventors, you know, will say, use that as a goal and ultimately achieve that. You've become quite a bit of a social media maven. You may be sort of the oldest, most followed person. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the, the, you know, I think Katy Perry is first, you know, there's nobody over 30 on this list, all right? Was this a plan, or did it just sort of turn out that way? I, I had, you know, my Star Trek fans, mm -hmm. and I wanted to keep in touch with them, so I had a blog in the 1990s, in, okay. in the 20th century. <laughs> but Way uh, back. <laughs> way back, another century back. But I, we started developing a musical on what I considered the mission in my life. I grew, I, I grew up imprisoned in these U.S. Uh, internment camps. That transformed the, ja the lives of all Japanese Americans. After the uh, internment, I watched my parents struggle to get back on our feet. But it took my father, who uh, lost everything in the mi middle of his life, to explain to me our democracy. He said it's a people's democracy. And we people have the potential to do great things, but we are also fallible human beings. And that fallibility will be a part of that, this democracy that we work in. He said it takes people who cherish the best ideals of, of our democracy and commit themselves to working for it. And uh, it's a subject that very few Americans knew about back then and still today. And those that know about it. was nowhere it, in my history books. No, the Second nowhere. World War, just not there. I look for it too as a yeah. teenager, and it's not there. And even today, those who claim to know about it have it uh, uh, misunderstand the meaning. Or a cleansed version of it. Or yeah, something. or they, uh, they use words like uh, sequestered uh, mm -hmm. uh, Japanese, uh, uh, native uh, Japanese. We're Americans. Right. We were Americans. And yet our own government imprisoned us in our uh, own country because we happened to look like the people that bomb, bombed Pearl Harbor. And so we had to, first of all, raise the awareness of that chapter of, of American history. And what better way than social media? So you already had the built-in Star Trek fan base. You already had this foundation, and now it can grow and multiply through these other important parts of your life, because now people care about you. But how to grow that? It was science fiction that brought these people together. Mm -hmm. But what common denominator can I use to keep not only the uh, Star Trek fans, but other people? And by trial and error, I discovered it was humor, and particularly a rising star named Grumpy Cat. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it grew and grew, yeah. and as it grew, I started injecting certain inspirational stories, certain uh, informational uh, subjects. And then I introduced the fact that we were incarcerated and how that really isn't America. The best of America is the polar opposite of that sort of thing. Stories like the Attorney General of California, 
who was a good man, who knew the law, but he was an ambitious politician. The, the most popular issue in California in the 1940s was to get rid of the Japs movement. And he decided he's going to be an outspoken leader for the get rid of the Japs movement. And he made an amazing statement. He said, there have been no reports of sabotage or spying or fifth column activities by Japanese Americans. And that is ominous because the Japanese are inscrutable. You don't know what they're thinking. So we better lock them up before they do anything. So he's taking the absence of evidence and using it as an evidence. As the absence. evidence. Right. And he became very popular. He, uh, the internment happened. He was elected governor of California and then went on to become the chief justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. His name is Earl Warren, the great liberal chief justice of the Supreme Court. Even he has had that fallibility. And I like to think that uh, he became the liberal Supreme Court chief justice because of the guilt that he felt. And in his memoirs, after he, which was published after he passed, he did admit to that. And he said he regretted that. So I can think of no better next person to take us to the next place than George Takei. <laughs> I think if, if in the United States we, we had knighthood, well, so flattered. You, you would definitely be <laughs> Sir George. <laughs> but I think your social following is the equivalent of, in America, what would otherwise be knighthood <laughs> elsewhere. So. Well, we call that the... Uh, the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. Or oh, something okay, like that, yeah, that, that happens too. We got that. Thanks, George, well, thank for you being for that on, on Innovators. Mm -hmm.